Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Autism Advocacy Day 2024. My name is Katie Torino, and I'm the chair of APAM, Advocates for Autism at Massachusetts, and your host for today. It is both an honor and a privilege to stand here today, surrounded by so many passionate individuals. We're all here because the current state of affairs for autism children and adults simply isn't good enough. We've made a commitment, a shared pledge, to take action. Here at APAM, we collaborate with families, member organizations, advocates, and local officials. Together, we strive for strong reaching positive impacts on individuals with autism and their caregivers. Our mission is to equip them with the resources they need to not just survive, but truly thrive. Just two decades ago, autism seemed a relatively rare condition. Today, it's the most prevalent developmental disability diagnosed in the U.S. The CDC's March 2023 report revealed a staggering statistic. One in every 36 children by age eight has received an autism diagnosis, with a concerning 27% of those requiring 24-7 adult care due to the severity. This brings us to a critical juncture. Autistic young adults now make up the majority of the turning 22 population, individuals transitioning to adult services. In 2019, they comprised 27% of this group, and today that number has skyrocketed to 15%. This dramatic rise in the autistic population tragically collides with a crippling lack of adult services. This deficit is largely fueled by a significant shortage of human services workers. And a recent study by the Association of Developmental Disabilities Providers found that a staggering 26% staff vacancy rate among providers. In Anger's 2023, the State of America's Direct Support Workforce Crisis Report cites that the average turnover rate of 44% of direct care workers compared to the national average across all industries of 3.8%. That's 44% to 3.8% for all industries. This translates into a real world crisis. Here in Massachusetts, 3,887 alone will be on wait list for day programs to establish benefits. And this is precisely why APM is once again championing the workforce crisis as the most pressing disability related issue demanding legislative action. We can't allow a situation to stand. We need a comprehensive approach that addresses both the growing needs for our autistic population and the crucial role followed by human services professionals play in their well-being. Together, let's push for change. Let's ensure a future where all individuals with autism have access to the resources and the support that they deserve to live in their lives. And now to guide us through this morning's event, please welcome our esteemed MCs, Reggie Williams, self-advocate and advisor to AM's executive committee and Heather Hinges. Including a show that you can watch today and every Tuesday at 2 p.m. called Common Sense. Prior to this school, Heather spent 23 years as an Emmy Award winning journalist in major US cities, including New York, DC, and Boston. She is the mother of two beautiful children, and her seven year old son has autism. Her personal experience has led her to become an advocate and volunteer, dedicating her time to helping people with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. Reginald Gary Williams, Reggie, is 31 years old and a graduate of this every year, Quinn's to go on to community college with a certificate in human services. Reggie is a self-advocate with a passion for helping other families get what they want in Reggie is on HMA's advisory board because he believes there are families and individuals who are at a crossroads, feeling a little lost and helpless as they cannot maintain the services and supports needed for their loved one. Reggie believes that one resource, one connection, or one person can make a powerful difference to others and themselves. I'd now like to ask Reggie to introduce Lieutenant Governor McKenzie.
Kim Driscoll was the mayor of Salem for 17 years. As mayor, she turned financial de deficits into record surpluses, finalized Salem City services, including in schools. We want to Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and the administration for Governor Healy's fiscal year 25 scheme budget, which provides healthy support for people who have autism and their families. We are particularly grateful for the governor's $485 million investment in Chapter 257, which would increase the pay raise to provide a competitive wage for direct service providers. A family's bond that the Lieutenant Governor is here this morning to share remarks in the Autism Advocacy, Advocacy Day Proclamation. Please welcome Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Uh, thanks so much for giving me a few minutes to share why I'm excited to be here and to recognize some of the amazing work APM is doing. I, I want to first recognize Senator Joe Comerford, who's receiving the State Legislator of the Year Award. <laughs> and Rep. John Garbley, who's receiving the Autism Champion Award. <laughs> legislators here and I just want to thank them for not only for being here but for being such great strong partners and all that we're doing as we try and build the Massachusetts that's more affordable, more equitable, and certainly more competitive. The big part of that is ensuring that we've got everybody moving forward and there's room for everybody. You can't afford to leave anybody on the bench. And today your advocacy is really important as we think about the strengths, the investments, and supports we can put in place. Katie, you and your team do a great job not only with this event, but ensuring we're aware of what the key issues that we need to press forward with. We really appreciate that partnership. And Leo Sarkeesian from ARC, you're here somewhere, right? Where are you, Leo? He's in DC, so he's not actually here. He's here in spirit. I just wanted to recognize he's more than 30 years at the ARC. Uh, he can produce the work with him. We know this in the state pushing for the right things there, so that's great. Um, look, I am thrilled to join you for Autism Awareness Day. As you all know, Massachusetts is a leader when it comes to services for individuals with autism. We provide early intervention specialists, mass health coverage for diagnosis and treatment up to age 21. A special education law that requires each child's IEP team to address seven specific areas of need. That doesn't happen in every state. As somebody who chaired a school committee, who saw the loving attention that went in in so many of our public school districts to make sure everyone had an opportunity to, low, to learn and grow. And we've expanded coverage of the Department of Developmental Services for individuals with autism. We firmly believe that every single resident of Massachusetts deserves the opportunity to live their best life and reach their full potential. And frankly, that's what today is about. Whether in school or college, at work, at home, or in a residential, a residential campus, no one should ever be left out or left behind simply because they need some additional supports. So on behalf of our entire administration, I want to be clear that we see you, we hear you, we stand with you, and we're committed to meeting your needs. This year is a pretty important anniversary, 10 years since the state's autism optimus bill in 2014. The legislature passed a huge bill reflecting our state's commitment to addressing the needs of the growing numbers of people with autism in Massachusetts. As a result, this community and all of its advocates have had 10 years of support, investment, and resources. And I'm proud to say that we're going to continue in that vein as we move forward. As was mentioned, our FY25 uh, budget includes a four hundred a uh, $485 million investment in Chapter 257. Two, Let's hear it for that. Those things <laughs> That's 
directly funding that directly goes to health and human service providers. It enables us to offer living wages at a time when that is so difficult to do and the workforce challenges are so hard, particularly within, with respect to folks who are supporting individuals reach their best selves. Additionally, just this morning through EOPS and the Massachusetts State Police, we announced the implementation of the Blue Envelope Program. <laughs> And this is Ken Sam who came up with this idea and uh, really grateful that we'll have an initiative that can foster a safer and more understanding environment during traffic stops for drivers with autism. So simple yet so important and so critical. This is an initiative that reflects our administration's deep commitment to support programs that strengthen the facility and support law enforcement's ability to more effectively meet the needs of every single community member. Supports like this, well, they come together and they happen as a result of collaboration and partnership. And because of the work everyone here is, being, is doing together, we're able to achieve this type of success. This is what it means to be part of the Commonwealth, to be a state that's good for all of us, that recognizes that every stage of our lives, we can do more to support each other. I want to thank you all again for being here, for the work that you do each and every day. Please consider us allies in this work as we move forward. And now it's my honor to present the proclamation for, for um, Autism Advocacy Day. Right here. Thank you. Thank you. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts does hereby proclaim April 24 to be Autism Spectrum Disorder Awareness Month. Thank you. Oh, she's going. Yeah, I don't want to get hit. I don't want to. Wait. You're going to go stand your next after. Oh, let me take. No, the towel's up there. Let's go. Just put your hand on my shoulder. On my shoulder. Okay. Uh, so I just personally, you might remember me when I was a cup reporter at Boston 25, and I used to knock on your door a lot and remind you that I was from Linfield. So I wanted the scoop because I was a trolley tour guide in Salem. That was one of my first jobs. So I used to try to use that as an end to try to get the scoop. Uh, thank you so much for having me again. My name is Heather Hutchinus. I started FCA this event back in 2015 or 2016. In 2017, I stood before you, I had a child who was um, about 20 months old and he just received his autism diagnosis. So I actually started up seeing this event before I had any connection to autism, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and that first year, I came so teary-eyed because we had just received that, that diagnosis and early intervention had just stepped in. But this community has really helped me through that journey. And this year, uh, my son was diagnosed officially with an intellectual disability. So we're continuing on that journey. Um, and it's, it's been a very busy month because just a couple of days ago, I see a couple of familiar faces in the audience here. We had the very first profound autism summit Friday in Burlington, which was amazing. Thank you everybody in the audience for supporting that. For those of you who know profound autism is, it's a new term that the journal Lancet started recognizing, and the CDC now recognizes one in four children or in adults have profound autism, which means they have autism plus an intellectual disability, or they meet a certain criteria on their IQ scores. So it's been a busy month, and we appreciate all of the support here today and everybody making here today after several events. And I know there's more this week as well. Um, so I wanted to introduce you to a very special guest. His name is Adam Mandela Baldwin. He's a 26-year-old cellist and a composer. He was diagnosed with autism and epilepsy at the age of three. And it's is true for some kids and adults with autism, music is a connection for Adam. It's, it's been a source of communication for him as well. I was just having the pleasure of talking with mom Roseanne about how it has helped him generalize skills once he learned them on the cello. Uh, he's the first student with profound autism to attend Berkeley College of Music where he has been awarded a full academic scholarship. And his accolades are too numerous to mention, but listen to this. They include performing for the UN General Assembly. Also, uh, that was at a ceremony announcing the inauguration of World Autism Awareness Month. He's been performed with Jackson Brown and Wynton Marsalis. He also featured in the Emmy Award winning documentary, Autism the Musical and Autism the Sequel. So let's all give Adam.
time to put one more short piece for us? One more? It's short. Okay. There's more. <laughs> Good job, Adam. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Thank you for sharing your son with us. Just notice there are a lot of people over here. Feel free to filter in over here. There's, there's still some water and, and there's maybe some food over there. So yeah. please, anybody standing over there, please feel free to jump fill up these seats. Great job. Thanks, Silver. Okay, yeah. First of all, wow. Let's give it up for him. Thank you, Alan. That was really beautiful. Now I want to introduce Sam Kanji. Sam enjoys hearing speeches about his life experience, to teach people about autism, including to feature men, then include professionals as part of Operation Housebound. Sam also enjoys navigating at the State House, most recently on the blue envelope bill, which was sponsored by our distinguished legislator of the year, Senator Joe Comerford. Please welcome Sam Kanchin. Hi there, my name is Sam Kanchin. I'm happy. Back to be able to hear today to thank Senator Kalman as AVM's 2024 distinguished match made part of the end. Senator Kalman works very hard to make sure people with disabilities have the support services we need. Having in this room knows that you should never underestimate some of these abilities and they have answered regardless of where they are, of the answer that you give answer and they are not for them. We can express, we can also do our work. People expect a needling on a school to tell them what they do because they have so much trouble on each of the day. And now that they have a cut of a more years and has to enter into all that and to build a building. I have been in my career and project for almost two years. I often don't have my grandparents. I have that been stopped by police because I'm a very good safe driver. However, the plan accident or got 
to make sure that the rubber stops go smoothly. It is not lawful that not to drive a tenant cousin, but lawful to continue. They are caught a lot of things after that. You have asked the Senator Crawford, but the blue envelope from the Canadian, she told them, I did, you admit that you are caught to commit the last major. It's important that Senator Crawford uh, also talk to the police chiefs of the unit. We love the idea and gave his support to the law from Senator Crawford how uh, the bill with three federal committees finally on January 4th, 2024. Senator Crawford convinced on behalf of Senators to vote unanimously for the law of him. We hope that House votes to pass the law of him soon, too, so that it can become the law. Senator Crawford has to have hard on the budgetary in that state. To priorities that's a problem with arts and in the areas, not just a normal. Thank you, Senator Topper, for the education of arts and other disabilities. Thank you, Senator Topper. Very special, Sam, to have you offer this introduction because friends Sam Angie, and his mom, Elise Levine Angie, are forces of nature. And when this bill got introduced, they led so many in this room uh, to fight for it so that our colleagues in the legislature understood how important it was that we pass this bill into law and work with our great administrative colleagues. Uh, to make something happen. So please, let's give a huge round of applause. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you uh, for being such an icon for everything that's good in the Commonwealth. And you and uh, Governor Healy do create a Commonwealth where everyone can thrive. It's an honor to serve you. Uh, and I also want to shout out to my great partner in this bill, Representative Kay Khan, uh, who I believe is on her way, but Rep Khan and I have held this bill together, uh, and she is a wonderful partner. Congratulations to my great comrade, Representative Sean Marmley. We are partners on many efforts, uh, including public higher education, and Sean, who are just a world-class friend and a representative and well-deserved honor today. Um, I just want to shout out to <laughs> A personal word of thanks to my legislative director, Brian Rossman. Many of you in this room know Brian, and when he gets an idea in his head for a bill uh, that invites both uh, brain and heart, uh, there is nothing stopping Brian Rossman. And I'm deeply grateful for his service. We've worked together for five years. Lieutenant Governor said this well, um, and thanks to our friends at the State Police, we can see them here, but this, friends, is the Massachusetts Blue Envelope. As we said, this Blue Envelope will be available for free because of the work of the State Police, and people can go to the barracks, they can go online, uh, the State Police are working with their uh, mass chiefs, chiefs of police, to have this across the Commonwealth for anyone living with autism, along the autism spectrum disorder, to be able to get this envelope and in it put license registration, any kind of contact information. And let me say, we used to refer to the Connecticut Blue Envelope, but today in Massachusetts, we have our own Massachusetts Blue Envelope. I'm just holding, please, please, please. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this, this yeah. part, so I can get the phone. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Dang. Hang on, actually, let me do it again, just with...
morning, everybody. Good morning. Tyler, thank you so much for your most kind introduction. Thank you for everything you do. You're in this building more than some of the elected officials. <laughs> so much. I know my last name is a little difficult to pronounce. It is for me, too. So thank you. And I really, uh, and I will always listen to your mom. <laughs> Those who don't know Tyler's mom was Laura Sullivan, who is just an incredible advocate um, around individuals with disabilities. <laughs> this award, this recognition, uh, means so much to me, but more importantly, to be able to work collaboratively. Uh, with AFAM on a whole host of issues really means a lot. Uh, and all of you do so much great work across our community. I want to thank our good friend, Lieutenant Governor Ken Driscoll, who has been a long time champion of individuals with disabilities long before she was sworn in to become our Lieutenant Governor. And I want to thank my partner, my good friend, Senator Comerford, for well-deserved recognition this morning for her incredible work. He mentioned the incredible uh, Blue Envelope bill, but there are so many other pieces of legislation that we can point to that have more fingerprints and more importantly your heart in everything that you do. And I also want to thank my good friend, Representative Kate Hahn, who's also being recognized today for her incredible service over 20 something years uh, in this institution. And we thank you, Kay, very, very much. As Senator Comerford mentioned, nothing gets done in this building alone. We work with so many colleagues and staff who are here on so many important issues. If you're a staff person or elected official, please raise your hand. I do want to single out uh, our friend, Speaker Ron Mariano, the Chair of Weights and Needs, Eric Michaelowitz, the Chair of Children and Families and Persons with Disabilities, Jay Livingstone, and the Vice Chair of Children and Families and Persons with Disabilities, Jessica Giannino, for their outstanding work on individuals with disabilities. There are too many other elected officials here to uh, point them out by name, but they are here not because of me, but because of all of you. They know that you live in their districts and they want to partner with you on so many important issues. Uh, I do want to give a special shout out to Derek Keenan, my chief of staff who is here today and all of my staff and some of the work that they do on behalf of individual, individuals with disabilities. I'm so proud uh, to partner with AFAM last session as we passed a piece of legislation I filed on as the Macy Bill, which opened the doors for public higher education, for students from public higher education, all 29 institutions across this Commonwealth. I've been proud to work on this bill for many, many years. I see a you know, former filer of the bill, our good friend Barbara Italian, and there are so many other folks who work so hard uh, on this bill. <laughs> partnering with the AFAM just last week. The House of Representatives passed a piece of legislation that got rid of some of the archaic language in our laws, also known as the R Word Bill. I see our good friend, Melissa Riley, from Senator <laughs> As I said earlier, nothing in this building gets done alone. We work hard together to pass important pieces of legislation, but the truth is nothing gets done without all of you. Your advocacy, you sharing your personal stories and what means the most to you, that's what moves lawmakers. 
That's what builds new partnerships. And that work is extremely essential. Uh, this year, this session, I'm so proud to partner with AFAM on the workforce bill, which is so critically important, which I filed with Representative Simon Cattell bill, the hospital training bill, expanding Nikki's law. So there is so much we can celebrate, but also so much that needs to get done. And we will with all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Garbler, for all your hard work on behalf of the autism community. And thank you, Tyler, for your warm introduction for the representative. I would like to take a few moments to say how grateful and blessed I am to celebrate and acknowledge what we have accomplished as a member of the autism community. I've always believed that one resource, one connection, or just one encounter between the impact of one family. I've always believed that we have a voice since the age of 10. I've been an advocate with my mom, and now as an adult, there's still, there are new challenges, but new possibilities and dreams to be realized. We too want to live for our lives. We also want the opportunities to work and live, as well as accomplish our dreams and goals in our communities. To all self advocates who are here today advocating for their future, I thank you. As John Nash would say, it is good to have a beautiful mind, but a greater gift is to discover a beautiful heart. And every single one of you has the same beautiful heart. I thank you very, very much. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Terry Ramos. Terry currently serves as the executive director partners for youths with disabilities or PYD, a national nonprofit work working with what's used to work with increase their potential, excuse me, their, their personal, educational, and career goals, and guiding organizations to become more inclusive. Terry has focused her career on the intersection of disability rights, special education rights, and civil rights. Her life's mission is to seek access to equal opportunities for families, and it is underrepresented communities and those with limited English, people who are, who are often underserved by established systems. She is the mother of two girls with autism. Today, she will share her story, her daughter Katie's story. Please welcome Terry. to look up at the sky. It's actually sunny today. Yeah. Yeah. That may not happen again. Take advantage of that. Um, as, uh, okay. Thank you so much thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everybody for coming here today. Um, my name is Jerry Ramos. I am a special wow. education and disability wow. rights attorney and I'm also the Executive Director of Partners with People with Disabilities. This was explained earlier. And of course, this is done here. It's a special capacity. I am here to share with you. This is top. I'll stay to your position. No, no. Here, the interview. As Reggie mentioned, I am a monitor of the system. They have very different profiles. My daughter, Eleanor, is in the future. But my other daughter, Patty, went to residential school. She's about 45 minutes. She's about 45 minutes. She's about 45 minutes. She's about 45 minutes. She was given a priority one determination by BDS. And for those of you that don't know the lingo, 
priority one is given to those individuals who have the highest motivation, behavioral, and care needs. When Kathy turned 14, she started working through a very comprehensive IEP focus on micro-vocational skills. We did everything by the book. Remember, I am a special education attorney. We involved PBS workers so we would understand Kathy's needs and the specialized behavioral and daily life supports that were essential for her future adult home. We filed all of the paperwork way ahead of time. But a few days before she turned 22, we had a meeting with PBS where we were told that they still did not have a house for her. Because of the workforce shortage and the impact of the pandemic, nothing was as we had been planning for the last six years. And here's an important fact of the turning 22 process. DDS priority one is not an entitlement to like special education. If you take your child home or tear down the proposed placement, they get scratchy off the list and lose the DDS house and supports. So I was stuck with a false choice. I had to take her home because the other option was homelessness. But the home was also not an option because priority one means that her needs are so severe that they can't intermittent at home. Three months went by with Kathy living at home because of a staff shortage. And my family funded around the clock specialized autism care so we all could be safe. When we finally moved her into a house, several events made it clear that there was not enough staff. Most of the staff were temporary and none of the staff were properly trained. None of them have specialized knowledge of autism. And Kathy's needs are profound. She needs help getting dressed, showering, dressing for the weather. None of them understood that her communication skills are impaired and that it would be up to them to come to her rather than waiting for her to articulate her needs. None of them have the training to handle her with difficult behavioral thing, where she may get frustrated and kick and bite or hit someone. Some things are more urgent than others. They forget to give her showers or to apply face medication. One weekend, she spent it all in pajamas. During a heat wave last summer, she was sent to her day program in long sleeve shirts and winter pants. She spends hours in her room alone, playing on her iPad with no stimulation or activities. These are the effects of a lack of staffing in the houses and the use of temporary and trained staff. And they would be so easily resolved with a non trained staff. Then there are more concerning things, like having her house fake, yeah. march into her room, naked in the middle of the night. Since Kathy's house has been understaffed, this resident has been able to repeatedly take off her clothes and walk around naked. A month after moving in with Kathy, let's start by saying that Kathy has the cognitive uh, age of a seven year old. She came to me in a Sunday night and begged me not to take her bath. She asked me, what do I need to learn so I don't need to ever go back to that house? I was floored because I realized how much she had internalized and was being traumatized by that scare. And I also thought how much must have been taken her to actually think of this and verbalize. Sadly, I had to take her back. Again, that was not an option because of the risk of hosting her main program and supports. And even sadly, and even more sadly, nothing has changed. This week, Kathy had her period. I recognize this, this uh, experience is going to make some of you uncomfortable, and I want you to think why. This week, Kathy had her period. It's scheduled. She has said usually once or twice a year. Before it happened, I did a lot of coordination. I spoke to the house manager. I spoke to the female staff. And I explained to them in very detailed terms what she would need, the hands-on assistance she would need in order to have her personal hygiene and get through this week. Friday night, I took her and her laundry home. And I realized when I went to do the laundry that she did not want any kind of sanitary protection the whole week. All of her pants and underwear were completely covered in blood through the seat area and the crotch area get soaked. Now one pair, all the pants, bathing pants, pajama pants, her sheets were soiled. And my heart just sank. Because what kind of a person has so little care for the dignity of another human being to watch them walk around with a huge blood stain in their pants? Just not pull them aside and say, hey, let's go to the bathroom and fix it. And especially when it's your job to do it. My daughter went through a week without any of the staff caring enough to help her. It's her job to assist her since she can't do it independently. 
the untrained staff risk Patty Cell and the health of her housemates who were exposed to those bloody wounds. The response by the staff of Yom Kippur Kat to help Kat is not only a job training and performance problem and a lack of understanding of the importance of their job, but also an infringement of her human right to live with dignity. Our staff workers need to be better trained and better paid. So they're invested in the community they serve, they understand their needs, and have the tools to be effective. We do not pay or train these workers even. And there needs to be enough staff so folks don't walk around with bloody clothes, naked, or spend hours alone in a room with a night. Years ago, we, and by we I mean we, this meeting, shut down the Fernal Center because it did not afford its residents the dignity and human rights and it was rampant negligent and abuse. Community setting staff that are not trained and not well paid create the same negligence and abuse. They're just in a different setting. We need to change that. We need funding and higher wages that would allow us to bring folks and will choose these jobs because they're invested in the work and know they will get a fair wage for their skills. We need enough workers so the workforce feels supported and does not burn out after a short period of time. Until we have more staffing, better paid, and better trained workers, the health, well-being, and human rights will continue to be at risk for so many including my daughter, Kathy. Let's change that. Thank you. If it's okay with you, I can have some just like home for Terry. Is yeah, that okay? Yeah. Was that okay? Yeah, of course. God. Wow. Terry, thank you so much for, sharing, for sharing your story. I now like to call up the fans, executive community member and the co-chair of today's event, Elise Levine Johnji, along with Representative Kay Khan, who recently announced her retirement after 30 years serving in the House. Uh, on behalf of AFM, I want to express our deep appreciation for your career-long advocacy on behalf of people who have autism in the wider disability community. Your 12 years of leadership as House Chair of the Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities led to so many important achievements, including Nikki's Law. Uh, which created a registry of caretakers who were incredibly accused of having abused a disabled person so that they could not continue abusing others. As Reverend Lee just said, we're hoping to expand the reach of Vicki's Law this session to include um, daily incidents. <coughs> Rep Khan, as you've said, everyone, no matter their ability level, deserves the right to respect dignity, and the opportunity to live their lives to the fullest. Thank you for working diligently to make that statement a reality. Oh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. And really, I think this is a team effort. I want to thank colleague, Representative Gar Garvey, Senator Comerford, who were here also. I think the Lieutenant Governor was also here earlier. And, uh, and I also want to mention the state police who were here uh, and handing out the blue envelopes that uh, we've been working on for quite some time. And we're hoping to get the bill passed this session, but we really thank you for your support uh, through all of this effort. So I, I just feel so honored and privileged that, that I've had the opportunity to be here in the legislature. It feels sad to me, but I know I'm living in very good hands with many of the legislators who are here, not just here today, but are here in the building. I know that I'm taking care of folks who are 
um, who have autism and other disabilities. It's really a number one priority for legislators, and I know that they will continue uh, this effort. And I also want to thank ABAM and ARC as well. I don't think I mentioned that, but anyway, I just thank you so much for having the opportunity to work with all of you. And I think we've heard how more work needs to be done, absolutely, more funding, uh, more workforce. Uh, so there's still a lot to do, even though I think we've tried, and we will keep trying, and we will keep going until we can do everything we need to do to get this done. And you've got great leadership uh, with all of the uh, folks in the, with the advocates, and I know that they will not stop. They will keep going. And they have a lot of energy, and uh, I know that they'll be behind all of this as we go forward. So thank you very much today, and to see all of you. So. Well, Really quickly, I'm just going to really speed through some of the uh, elected officials we want to just uh, acknowledge being in the room today or having representatives. Uh, Rob Consalvo is here, Representative Consalvo, Representative Mullen, Representative Howard, Senator Eldridge. And, and again, thank you to all of you for making the time for uh, having your uh, representatives uh, be here on your behalf. Repres uh, a representative from Representative Bud Williams' office is here. Someone from uh, Representative Beatty Cruz's office is here. A legislative assistant for Representative Jerry Parisella is here. A representative from Kim Ferguson's office is here. Uh, Adrian Madrar, Madrar uh, Ted Phillips, Senator Brenda Crichton, uh, Representative Jessica Gian Giannino, sorry, Jessica. Uh, representative uh, Alice Heisch is here in person. Also, Representative Estella Reyes. Representative from the office of Senator Paul Feeney is here. Representative Jim O'Day, Senator John Keenan, uh, Senator Becca Rausch, Representative Carol Fioli, uh, Representative from Kate, uh, Johnny Q's office is here. Representative Angela Popolo Jr. is here. Representative Sally McKearns is here. A representative from Francisco Polito's office is here. A representative from Brian Denise Garlick's office is here. So we thank you all for making the time or for having me. <laughs> I don't know how I got this honor, but I'm so excited to have the opportunity to introduce somebody who's a friend to many of us in this audience. And I'm so excited to introduce her with her new title. Uh, Laura Sullivan, many of you know and love, is now the Deputy Executive Director of the Ark of Massachusetts. Yeah, Laura! Woo! Well, well. This was so well deserved after spending 10 years leading government affairs for the art. Uh, she's also the director, you may know, of, Oper of Operation House Call, a nationally recognized training program in partnership between the art and all major Massachusetts medical schools. Maura is a registered lobbyist. She advocates for AFAM's policy and budget priorities here at the State House. And her advocacy work includes the passage of legislation for the autism and IBD community. Things like Nikki's Law, uh, the Police Training in Autism legislation, and of course, Operation House Call as well. Uh, in her work at the State House, she's lobbied successfully for significant increases in funding for the DDS budget, the workforce, as you've been hearing many of our speakers talk about today, and Mass Health. She's a former Lent Fellow with a master's degree in public administration from Suffolk University. As you know, she is a mother, a mother of three, and she has two adult sons with autism and intellectual disability. Warren, come on up. Yeah, Mola! to always work with you and our paths keep crossing so i love it uh you and reggie have done a spectacular job today thank you 
I am so touched and inspired by all of our speakers and honorees and the lieutenant governor and our self-advocates. Uh, one in particular makes me especially proud. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff Tyler. <laughs> I actually want to shout out to my other son, Neil, who struggled to be safe or regulated in this environment. People with profound autism, you've heard from Katie, make up about 27% of the spectrum. And they may not be filling the room here today, but they are strongly represented in our advocacy today and always. And I want to send some support and some hope to them, to their caregivers, their teachers, and their health care providers. I am so grateful for the first ever Profound Autism Summit um, brought to us by the Profound Autism Alliance and the Shoma Learning Group. <laughs> it's so exciting about that conference for me was that we had legislative representation there. Um, we had our champion, Representative Garbali, come and speak to hundreds of people about the importance of advocacy for profound autism. And uh, thank you so much for empowering all of those folks. It's not easy to share your story when your story involves profound autism, and you really inspire the crowd. So, thank you. first time today at Autism Advocacy Day. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And I'm sorry if you can't find your way out of this building. That takes, that takes you. Uh, okay. And also, have people seen our posters and our flyers? They're fantastic. Shout out to Chris Hubbard for putting this together. We have exponential growth in autism the doubling of the number of people with autism moving into adulthood and turning 22, doubling in five years. Um, and then the shrinking of our human services workforce. That's just a recipe for disaster, and that's where we are. You heard from Katie, over 3,700 adults with autism or IBD are currently unserved in the Commonwealth. There's something we can do, and that's why we're here together. We can address the continued failure of our state to take care of its citizens with autism, especially those with the highest needs. Today, going forward, we can influence Massachusetts lawmakers. There's so many of them here today. And I'm gonna give you your call to action right now. Are you ready? You're going to go visit, call, email, and connect with your legislators in their offices today or very soon. I love them. Stop. You're not going to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to tell them that they must maintain the governor's historic investment in the workforce, the $485 million for human services that will get our rates up to $20 per hour. And that's from as low as $16 per hour for some of our workers. That is number one. Number two, we must agree that $134 million of increases in the DDS budget should be maintained. Use that money, transfer it to families waiting for services if needed. Number three, we really need our lawmakers to reverse the proposed PCA cuts. These cuts will affect thousands with autism, including my son. No cuts. And when they ask why, here are some of your messages to go along with your shared story. The autism community is done with untrained, temporary staff. We're done with isolation, regression, increased 911 calls, home crisis calls, boarding in the emergency department, and economic hardship for our families. The status quo is untenable. I think this is a clear and powerful ask. 
and you can find all of the information on our fact sheets as well. Okay, so let me wrap things up with our bill priorities. So you can still with me? <laughs> okay, we have a broad platform with bills to protect our most vulnerable. You've heard about uh, Rep. Garvey's expanding Nikki's law. Um, all the way to the blue envelope. Thank you to, to Senator Comerford and Rep. Khan. Um, we have passed a lot of significant legislation as, as a community, um, but we have a long way to go to meet the needs of people with autism when it comes to housing. Um, what is it going to take to pass our accessory dwelling unit bill? Health care. You heard from, from Rep. Garvey. Hospital training is a key. Um, thank you to Chair Long for passing that bill out of healthcare finance and giving it a shot this session. Education bills. We have bills to support caregivers. We need to pay caregivers to be PCA and AFC providers. Um, and last, but so important, this equitable access to ABA for adults. Let's move that bill out of committee. Yeah. All of our priorities are in your packets. Um, you can find me and the other AFAM members to learn more about these bills or get fact sheets specifically. But find the bills that ignite your passion. Start by building some trust with your elected officials and their staff. Because these relationships, they lead to really sharing your lived experience. And it's not easy. Sometimes you got to be brave. Um, but share it, whether it's your personal, your family experience, or as a professional. The stories are what stick. And your lived experience will enlighten your lawmakers. Sometimes it might shock them. But it will bring change. So professionals out here in the audience, please be strong advocates for your families, especially those who aren't there, don't have a seat at the table, and relay their stories, and keep supporting them the way you do. For the future of people with autism, we must rely on advocacy here and at a federal level. Lean in with AFAM and the ARC, and we will make it easier. Being here today, this is my 10th year doing this event, and it's truly a gift, and it gets me to feel stronger and keep going. So thank you all so much. I'm going to bring Katie up now to close things up. in the room, um, we have Senator Nick Collins here in person, a representative of Senator Robin Kennedy's office, and a representative of Sen Senator Patrick Wilmer's office. So thank you uh, so much for being here today. Um, wow, what an impactful morning that this has been. Uh, it's been truly remarkable to hear from such passionate advocates and witness the dedication of everyone here today. To our guests and speakers, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. You've empowered us all to make a positive difference amongst the lives of the people with disabilities and autism. To Heather and Reggie, thank you for once again for guiding us here this morning. To Adam, thank you for lifting us up and incredible talent. To our incredible volunteers, your tireless efforts are what make this event possible, and we couldn't do it without you. And a special thank you to some of our heavy lifters, Alice Lubin Kanji, Laura Sullivan, Chris Hubbard, and Louise Blow. Take a moment to thank our generous sponsors Amigo, Bailey Smith, Doug Clooney Jr. Foundation for Autism, HMEA Autism Resource Center, <laughs> Massachusetts, Autism Alliance, House of Possibilities, Insurance Resource Center for Autism and Behavioral Health, the League School of Autism, LifeWorks, May Institute, and Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council. It's a growing list of supporters. It's great to see you and your support is our mission. So thank you for believing in the work that we do. As we move forward, let's carry the energy of the enthusiasm from today into action. 
and learn how we can do that in the long run. Together, we can create a brighter future for individuals with autism. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.